All right, well, good morning. So once again, if you're uh, joining us here in person or maybe you're watching via the live stream or you come across this video at a later time, uh, once again, we want to welcome you to uh, Fresh Vision uh, Calvary Chapel uh, here in El Paso, Texas, far west Texas. And as always, we want to know how everybody is doing. If you're watching via the live stream or maybe even here in person, you want to learn more about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, I would direct you to our website at fvccelp.com. And if you go to our website, this is um, what it looks like. And um, if you want to learn about the church, I would direct you to the upper right-hand tab. That's a site menu. That's kind of like our table of contents for the website there. Um, our vision and our mission statement, our statement of faith, a short biography about Pastor Angel is up there as well. And um, I do want to direct you to our media tab. If you click on that, it'll take you to our iTunes podcast, our SoundCloud, as well as our YouTube channel. So if you want to listen to any of our past studies, um, you can listen there free of charge. And we do want to encourage you all to share those um, on your own social media platforms for the purposes of spreading the gospel. You know, the, you think about social media, it's not being used very much for God's glory nowadays. So we want to use it to, um, to channel the love of Jesus Christ as much as we possibly can. So if you go back to the home menu there, let's say you want to get in contact with the church during the week, you can uh, certainly... Do that, if you go back to the, the site menu, go to contact us, it'll take you to kind of the mid to the bottom section there of the, of the webpage. Um, and there you can actually leave a comment, leave a prayer request. It's, it's kind of like an electronic version of that um, information card that we have in the back there. And you can fill that out. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. And, um, and Sam, if you just scroll a little bit up the other way, there we go. Um, there are some links to our social media, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram and uh, YouTube. And um, once again, it's not about likes, but rather it's about spreading the love of Jesus Christ. And we want to use those different avenues um, to do that. So if you go back to our homepage, um, oh, I forgot to mention, we don't have a formal offering here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. However, as the Lord leads you to give, we do have the um, agape box in the back. And if you want to give electronically, there's a way to do that online. If you go to online giving, this is actually at the very bottom of the website. There's a link to PayPal, and you can actually donate there. Um, if you're watching via the live stream, there's actually a link to PayPal um, in the video description at the bottom. Um, and also, if you want to leave a comment, uh, please feel free. There's somebody uh, watching the page now, so then they can uh, get to you or get back to you um, very quickly here in real time. Okay, so I think that is um, all of the information I'll share for now on the website. There's a lot of stuff on there, so I do want to encourage you all to visit the website. Um, with the latest updates and um, uh, just the things that are going on here at the church. And just some general announcements on Wednesday evenings. Uh, the men are gathering here at the church at 6.30. And uh, we're currently going through um, the book of Genesis. And um, we also share a meal together. We have a Bible study. We have a time of fellowship. And um, if you're interested, please uh, come by. Uh, reach out to the church. We can get you more information about that. Uh, we'll be in uh, chapter 6. We'll continue in chapter 6 this upcoming week. So if you want to re read ahead, go ahead and, um, and do so, please. And then we also have a youth ministry, uh, the Unashamed Youth Ministry. We meet right after announcements. And we're, we're going to be in the back right now. But we're currently going to the Gospel of Luke. But we have another event coming up this week um, on Thursday. We will be going to Western Playland at 5.30. And um, I'll, I'll give you some more information probably after the service. I'll talk to the youth let me go to the back in just a little bit here. Uh, but that'll be at 5.30 at Western Playland. And that'll be our, our concluding event for the, for the month of October. And we'll do something else in November or a couple of other things in November. And um, if you have any questions about that, please just let us know after the service. And we can get you um, that information, okay? And of course, that's open to everybody as well. If you have any friends you want to invite, you can, you can do that um, if that's what you're desiring to do. Um, what else? We have a children's ministry as well. If you have young children, maybe that's keeping you from coming to church. If you're watching via the live stream, um, bring them with you. We'll have a place for your children. Um, they meet right after announcements as well in the back. And um, don't let that be a hindrance. Bring everybody to church with you, right? Um, I guess don't bring your pets, but you know, bring, bring your children with you. Bring everybody with you. And um, there'll be a, a place for everybody here. Okay, I think that's the extent of the announcements for this morning. So I guess I'll pass it to Pastor Angel. So this morning, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 20, and we're also going to cover, or try at least to cover, chapter 21. And I've titled today's message, 
Heavy is the head that wears a crown. When we concluded <clears throat> last week, chapter 19 last week, we saw that at the end of that chapter that a dispute had erupted between the tribe of Judah and the ten tribes of Israel as, as to who had a greater claim to David. See, the men of Israel were upset that the men of Judah had been escorting the king back to Jerusalem without their knowledge or involvement. And so now as we get to chapter 20, there it's going to inform us how one man took advantage of the feud that had erupted between Judah and Israel and the events that took place to stop him from dividing the nation. Now, when we get to chapter 21, there it's going to tell us how a drought that had been caused by Saul's sin forced David to make some difficult decisions and what he did to calm the tensions afterwards. And in the final part of that chapter, we're going to read about some giant battles the king and his army had fought through. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, it is a, a great and beautiful Sunday morning that you've created for us. And we're so thankful and joyful and humbled, Lord, that you've created this for us. Lord, and so now as we continue in this time of, of worshiping you, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us powerfully with the words that I'm about to read from, from your living word and the message that you helped me to prepare, Lord, that you gave me to prepare. So bless this morning, bless this time we have together, Lord, protect us from any harm that may be considering walking through those doors, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit just work powerfully here among us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Second Samuel chapter 20. Now, a wicked man, a Benjamite named Sheba, son of Bert, Bert, Bitri, Bitri, happened to be there. He blew the ram's horn and shouted, We have no portion in David, no inheritance in Jesse's son, each man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, son of Bitri. But the men of Judah, from the, from the Jordan all the way to Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. When David came to his place in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and placed them under guard. He provided for them, but he was not intimate with them. They were confined until the day of their death, living as widows. The king said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to me within three days and be here yourself. Amasa went to summon Judah, but he took longer than the time allotted, allotted him. So David said to Abishai, Sheba, Son of Bit Bitri will do more harm to us than Absalom. Take your Lord's sol soldiers and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and elude us. So Joab's men, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and all the warriors marched under Abishai's command. They left Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bitri. They were at the great stone of Gibeon when Amasa joined them. Joab was wearing his uniform and over his belt around his waist with a sword in his sheath. As he approached, the sword fell out. Joab asked Amasa, Are you well, my brother? Then, with his right hand, Joab grabbed Amasa by the beard to kiss him. Amasa was not on guard against the sword in Joab's hand, and Joab stabbed him in the stomach with it and spilled his intestines on the ground. Joab did not stab him again, and Amasa died. Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bitri. One of Joab's young men had stood over Amasa, saying, Whoever favors Joab and whoever 
is for David. Follow Joab. Now, Amasa had been withering in his blood in the, mid in the middle of the highway, and the men had seen all the troops, and when the men, and the men had seen that all the troops stopped. So he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him because he realized that all those who encountered Amasa were stopping. When he was removed from the highway, all the men passed by and followed Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Betri. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Maka, and all the Baratites Bar came together and followed him. Joab's troops came and besieged Sheba in Abel of Beth Maka. They built a siege ramp against the outer wall of the city while all the troops with Joab were battering the wall to make it collapse. A wise woman called out from the city, listen, listen, please tell Joab to come here and let me speak with him. When he had come near her, the woman asked, are you Joab? I am, he replied. Listen to the words of your servant, she said to him. He answered, I'm listening. She said, I, in the past, they used to say, seek counsel and Abel. And that's how they settled disputes. I am one of the peaceful and faithful of Israel. But you are trying to destroy a city that is like a mother in Israel. Why would you devour the Lord's inheritance? Joab protested, never. I would never devour or demolish. That is not the case. There's a man named Sheba, son of Bitri, from the hill country of Ephraim, who has rebelled against King David. Deliver this one man, and I will withdraw from the city. The woman replied to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown over the wall to you. The woman went to all the people with her wise counsel, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bitri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the ram's horn, and they dispersed from the city, each to his own tent. Joab returned to the king in Jerusalem. Joab commanded the whole army of Israel, Benaniah, son of Jehodiah, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Adoram was, was over forced labor. Jehoshaphat, was son of, uh, son of Ahilud, was court historian. Shiva was court secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And in addition, Ira, the Jerite, Jer was David's priest. Now, it says... At the end of verse of chapter 19, that the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the words than those of the men of Israel, meaning that they were pretty hard on them. As a result, the people of those ten tribes felt angry, they felt hurt, they felt disappointed. Well, one man saw this as an opportunity to make his move to get the power that he desperately wanted. It says in verse 1 that a wicked man named Sheba happened to be there during that argument between Israel and Judah. Now, being a Benjamite, it's possible that he may have been related to Saul, and he may have been also a high-ranking representative of those ten tribes. So, upon hearing the disrespectful manner in which the men of Judah argued their claim on David, Sheba stepped up and defiantly announced that the ten tribes had no portion in David and were essentially seceding. They were essentially separating themselves from the nation. Now, was Sheba declaring war on Israel? No, not necessarily. Now, initially, all he did was to blow that horn and tell all those who came from the northern tribes to go home and to not follow David any longer. But when he began to march through the northern tribes, trying to gather a following, trying to gather uh, troops and supplies and 
um, a big following, he was essentially, with that, he was essentially declaring war. However, it appears that, well, according to, to verse 13, it appears that not a lot of people responded. And Sheba and his followers ended up in the walled city of Abel. In the meantime, David and the Judeans continued on their journey back to Jerusalem. And when he arrived at the palace, he reasserted his authority and made some, started making some decisions or started taking action. One of his first actions was that he took the ten concubines that he had left there to take care of the palace and who had been intimate who had who Absalom his son Absalom took and slept with in um, in public so that everyone can see he took those ten concubines and and arranged for them to be indefinitely confined at another location under guard now the last two sentences of verse 3 notes that he provided for them. He took care of them, but he wasn't intimate any longer. You see, they had been defiled now. According to this tradi- the tradition they had, um, these concubines belonged solely to the king, and no one was allowed to touch them. And now that they had been, they were now defiled and... Um, David couldn't be with them anymore. And unfortunately, these women had to live the rest of their lives as widows. Well, after this, it was now time to deal with Sheba's shenanigans. And David delegated that task to his newly appointed military commander, Amasa. The king ordered him, go out and assemble the soldiers of Judah. And within three days, and within those three days to to capture, to pursue and capture the rebel leader, Sheba. But for some unexplained reason, and I, I can stand here and speculate all kinds of things, but the main thing is that he couldn't get the job done. He couldn't come back. He didn't come back within the uh, within that time frame, and couldn't complete his task, his mission, within that time frame. So David then placed Abishai in charge of that operation, and so he set out with the king's soldiers to find Sheba to prevent him from getting established in one of the fortified cities. Among those who went with him was his brother, Joab, which was the former commander who Amasa had replaced. Now, on their way there, uh, there comes strolling towards them Amasa. They met with Amasa at Gibeon, which was about five miles north of Jerusalem. Amasa approached uh, Joab and Pretending to greet Amasa warmly, he grabbed him by his beard as if to just give him a a kiss and killed, stabbed, Joab stabbed Amasa with his dagger. With one kiss, one thrust, and zero words, Joab swiftly, silently, and mercilessly gained revenge for his lost position. Masa didn't even see it coming. So now along with Abner and Absalom, Amasa is now added to the list of notable A names that Joab had murdered. And yet another aspect of all this is, is the fact that First Chronicles chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says that these two men were related. They were cousins, which further validates the prophetic words that Nathan uttered to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. The sword will never leave your house. 
So leaving his rival's body in a pool of blood in the middle of the highway, Joab took command and continued to pursue Sheba as if nothing at all had happened. But when he realized that Amasa's corpse was distracting the troop movement, distracting his troops from marching forward to their uh, to where they needed to go. Instead of burying him, all, he just basically dragged his body to the to a nearby field and just threw a garment on him. The right thing to do was at least to appoint someone to bury him, to put a marker there. That would have been the honorable thing to do. That would have been right for Amasa and his family. And it just would have showed some kind of respect, but there was none there. He just, like if he was an animal, he threw him to the side of the road and put a garment over him. After this, Joab called for reinforcements and he marched to the northern fortified city of Abel of Beth Maka. And it was there that he found Sheba, safely hiding behind the city walls, where I'm sure that he intended to remain as long as he needed to. He was there to, he was like, I'm in a safe place, nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to wait things out until Joab's troops get tired, they get hungry, and they just, they miss their families, and they're going to go home, and I'll be okay. So he was ready, he was ready to play the long game there. But Joab wasn't going to play that game. He wasn't going to play the waiting game. So he set up his engineers. He had his engineers build a siege ramp. And while they were doing that, his troops began battering the wall to make it collapse. Now, in the process of all that, he was, Joab was contacted by a wise woman from the city there who yelled over the wall that she wanted to talk to him. And when he did, when he approached her and said, here I am, she told him that the city was once known as a place where wisdom was found. And then asked him why he was trying to destroy her city that was like a mother in Israel. And who had always been faithful and peaceful to the nation. Why he was trying to destroy, like, like a mother who was wise. Why he was trying to destroy that city. To this, Joab replied, that he wasn't, that he was not attacking the city, per se, but he only wanted Sheba, the rebel who had presumed to lead Israel away from its king. She, he told her that if she would assist him in delivering Sheba over, that he would end his siege. It'd be over. It'd be done with. We don't have to tear down these walls. We don't have to climb over it. We just want Sheba. Can you give him to us? And so she said, yeah, I told them what's going to happen. And then she went back to the people of the city. And sure enough, it didn't take long before the head of Sheba was tossed over the wall and caught by Joab. Now, by doing this, this wise woman, and here's again, we have to give credit to, to this is a, a one other important woman in, in, in the Bible here, but because of her actions, because of what she did, not only did she save her city from being destroyed, but she also eliminated a threat that could have destabilized the entire nation. Now, I 
a commentator made this spiritual analogy out of Sheba. Um, his rebellion and his refuge in the city of Abel that I, I believe fits well. And he said this, every, every man's breast is a city enclosed. Every sin is a tra traitor that lurketh within those walls. God, ca God calleth for Sheba's ne head, neither hath he any quarrel to us for our person, but for our sin. If we love the head of our traitor above the life of our soul, we shall justly perish in the vengeance. Well, with the head of Sheba now in his possession, Joab stopped the siege, dismissed the troops, and returned to Jerusalem with ready to speak those words to the king, mission accomplished. After returning, it looks like David brushed aside what Joab had done to Amasa, because it isn't brought up, it isn't mentioned anymore. And also because he's the first name, his name, Joab's name is the first to appear in this list of David's important officials. And there in verse 23, it says that Joab commanded the whole army of Israel. Now the last three verses of the chapter named the others, who the others were. Benaniah um, became leader of David's special forces and his bodyguards. And 1 Kings 3, 235 says that he eventually, he eventually replaced Joab at the beginning of Solomon's reign. Adoram was placed in charge of forced labor, a position he retained in the governorship, of, in the government of Solomon. The Jehoshaphat was the court historian and was probably assisted by Shiva, the court secretary. Zadok and Abiathar remained as chief priest, but now Ira was serving as David's own personal priest. What's interesting here is that Ira's name and position replaced his son, replaced the position his sons held back when we were given this list in chapter 8, another version of this list in chapter 8. All right. So, again, I wanted to give you a little bit more context what was going on here, but I hope that you can see by now that David's life wasn't a fairy tale. And he in no way after this lives happily ever after. See, David's difficulties after his moral collapse were many. And they were extremely painful. And so what I hope you've been able, you, I hope that you've been able to see that and you've been able to learn from those difficulties now, there are those who would say, who make this excuse, who justify their sins and say, well, David sinned too. But by this, they often mean David sinned, but then he repented. And then he went back on just as before. But that's not really true. He did sin and he did repent, but things did not go on as before. David's life was never the same after the fall. So therefore, we need to be careful not to minimize the consequences of sin, of the sin in, of sin in David's life. You see, sin, it's never, it's never, sin is never worth the price. And David, David's life illustrate, illustrates that fact dramatically. We should also recognize that all these difficulties were ultimately for David's good and for the good of God's people. And just as the difficulties also served to humble David and to make him more dependent upon God, the same could be said about our trials, 
our difficulties. See, God can take our painful experiences to produce humility, to produce a humility and a graciousness in us that may, may not have been there or it may not have been as evident before. Now, also, I also want you to think carefully some of the turning points in our text. David appoints Amasa commander in place of Joab. And by this, he wins the favor of the men of Judah. And yet Amasa is late in returning to Jerusalem with the armed forces of Judah, which then prompts David to send Abishai, Joab's brother, to search for Amasa. A dropped sword and an unsuspecting Amasa became the opportunity which Joab seizes to eliminate Amasa and to take his place. Two men, Sheba and an unknown soldier, urge the soldiers to act, and they do. A wise woman speaks out, convincing Joab that he need not take a war, uh, he need not make war of, of Sheba's rebellion, and Joab agrees. So again, three turning points here. So what I hope this chapter has, uh, has done is that it's opened your eyes to see the unseen hand of God at work in the life of these people, of his people. There is one very clear example of divine providence here in our text. And that is God's providential preparation of the nation of Israel for its future division. Because they will be eventually be divided. Now observe this, the, the word spoken by Sheba there in verse 1. He said, we have no portion in David, no inheritance in Jesse's son. Each man to his own tent, Israel. Now compare the word spoken by Sheba in our text with the word spoken by the tribes of Israel, after the death of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16. When all of Israel saw that the king did not, the new king did not listen to them, that is the king after, after Absalom, the people answered the king saying, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Israel, return to your tents. David, now look after your own house. So Israel, so Israel went to their tents. It's almost as if Sheba's words became the motto of those who rebelled in Israel. The roots of division between Judah and the other tribes of Israel run deep in the history of Israel. But it's evident that Israel was a divided kingdom for a very short time in David's day. This division never completely healed. It may lay dormant for the years of Solomon's reign, but it comes back to life. It reemerges. And as I said, it comes back to life after Solomon's death. In all this... In all of that, God is preparing the nation for the division he purposes. The second time, the second time the nation divides, it won't. It will no longer reunite. The northern, the northern kingdom will fall to Assyria as a lesson to Judah, a lesson which will not be heeded. And so when the southern kingdom and, and, and the southern kingdom eventually end up falling to, but to the Babylonians. See, God is, again, providentially preparing the nation for their coming division. Now, trying to move along quickly here because I, I realize that there's a lot more to cover. But um, before I move on to chapter 21... I, it's important to take a moment just to let you know that many Bible scholars, teachers, consider chapters 21 through chapter 24 an epilogue. 
or an appendix that highlights various incidents in the life of David and aren't in chronological order. More than likely, the contents were just additional material the author of, the, of these books, First and Second Samuel, that he may have had with him, and, and he could only put these stories at the end of Second Samuel, at the end of the book. Actually, if you go to First Kings chapter one, it picks up where Second Samuel chapter 20, verse 26 leaves off. So if you want a, the continuation of this story, you can go to First Kings chapter one from here. But, um, but that's not what we're going to do. We're not going to go to First Kings. Uh, we're going to finish these last few chapters because these stories and these poems are just as valuable and life-changing as everything else in the Bible. So turn with me now to chapter 21 as we get into the last section of 2 Samuel. And here I am going to break it down into two separate readings. Um, all right, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. During David's reign, there was a famine for three successive years. So David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered, it is due to Saul and his bloody family because he killed the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were not Israelites, but rather a remnant of the Amorites. The Israelites had taken an oath concerning them, but Saul had tried to kill them in his zeal for the Israelites in Judah. So David summoned the Gibeonites and spoke with them. He asked the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? How can I make, your, how can I make atonement so that you will bring a blessing on the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites said to him, we're not asking for silver or gold from Saul or his family, and we cannot put anyone to death in Israel. Whatever you say, I will do for you, he said. They replied to the king, as for the man who annihilated us and plotted to destroy us so we would not exist within the whole territory of Israel, let seven of his male descendants be handed over to us so we may hang them in the presence of the Lord at, at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen. The king answered, I will hand them over. David spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between David and Jonathan, Saul's son. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, who, this is a different Mephibosheth, who were the two sons of Rispa, daughter of Aia, and born to Saul, and the five sons of Merib, daughter of Saul, and born to Adriel, son of Brazilia, the, the Meholathite, and handed him over to the Gibeonites. They hanged them, they hanged them on the hill in the presence of the Lord. The seven of them died together. They were executed in the first day of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Ritzpah, Aiah's daughter, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on the rock from, uh, from the beginning of the harvest until the rain poured down from heaven on the bodies. She kept the birds of the sky uh, from them by day and the wild animal, animals by night. When it was reported to David what Saul's concubine, Ritzpah, daughter of Aia, had done, he went and got the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. They had stolen them from the public square of Beth uh, Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung, hung the bodies the day the Philistines killed Saul at, at Gilboa. David had the bones brought from there. They gathered up the bones of Saul's family who had been hanged and buried and buried and buried the bones of Saul and his sons and his son Jonathan at Zela in the land of Benjamin in the tomb of Saul's father Kish. They did everything the king commanded. God, after this, God was receptive to the prayer for the land. 
Now, as I mentioned a bit ago, this chapter can be basically broken down into two subsections. And and the first subsection, which is what we read, tells us about a problem that David had inherited from his predecessor, King Saul. We're told right away that the problem was that was that uh, during David's reign, a three-year famine had broken out on the land. And what was the cause of that famine? Well, when he came to the Lord, the Lord told David that it was due to Saul and to his bloody family because he had killed the Gibeonites. And see, the backstory is this. Uh, when... Uh, when Saul was king, he broke the covenant that Israel had made with the Gibeonites all the way back in Joshua chapter 9. At that time, Israel, under Joshua's leadership, had just destroyed Jericho at Ai and was about to attack, attack the Amorite federation of the Canaanite hill country. The people of Gibeon, who were in the in the direct line of Joshua's conquest, pretended to be faraway aliens, and so escaped annihilation. Moreover, they tricked Joshua into making a covenant with them, whereby they would forever serve Israel in menial tasks, but could never be harmed. Now, although this covenant, Joshua agreed to this covenant before the Lord, um, Although it was, that covenant was made deceitfully, it was nevertheless binding and recognized by both the Israelites and the Gibeonites. Now, Saul, in an action that isn't, we're not told about, it's not mentioned anywhere in, in the Bible, apparently killed or had some Gibeonites killed when he was their king, when he was king. And when David learned that the famine had come on Israel as punishment for that covenant violation, he asked the Gibeonites, okay, well, what do you want? What, what should I do for you? And he said, you know what? We don't want money. We don't want silver or gold. We don't want any of Saul's money. We don't want none of that. And then they went on to explain that, that they would like to take vengeance into their own hands, but that they couldn't because... They weren't allowed to. They couldn't do it without permission. So instead, they asked that seven male descendants of Saul be given over to them in order to be hung. Well, David agreed. He consented and handed over the two sons of Ritzbah, Armoni and Mephibosheth. Now, this is, again, this isn't the same Mephibosheth that we have been reading about, the, the Mephibosheth son of Jonathan. And he also handed over the five sons of Saul's daughter, Merib. The other Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, was spared because of the oath that David had made with Jonathan. These seven sons and grandsons of Saul were publicly executed by the Gibeonites at the beginning of the harvest, uh, the barley harvest, which was probably early spring, and may have remained there for about six months until the rains arrived and the drought had ended in October. So for about six months, possibly. Ritzba, Saul's loyal concubine, set up a watch by the bodies. And uh, yeah, she set up a watch by the bodies day and night so that neither vultures nor wild beasts could touch them. And she did this until God eventually sent the rain to end the famine. And when David heard her devotion and heard and saw how much she had been in mourning, he took steps to give these seven bodies a decent burial. While doing so, he also took the bones of Saul and Jonathan which had been buried in Jabesh Gilead and laid them to rest in the tomb of Saul's father Kish there in the territory of 
the tribe of Benjamin. While the end of verse 21 now consists of the second subse- subsection and tells us some other details of David's wars against the Philistines and the battles against their giants. So let's finish. Let's go back there to chapter 21 and finish off this chapter. And again, I'll, I'll uh, come back and explain a few things here that we can learn from. That we can learn. Second Samuel chapter 21, verse 15. The Philistines again waged war against Israel. David went down with his soldiers and they fought the Philistines. But David became exhausted. Then Ibish, then um, then uh, Ibishi, Ib, Ishi, Ishibinab, Ishibinab, one of the descendants, uh, one of the descendants of the giant, whose bronze armor weighed about eight pounds, and who wore new armor intended to kill David, but Abishai, son of Zerui, came to his aid, struck the Philistine, and killed him. Then David's men swore to him. You must never again go out with us to battle. You must not extinguish the lamp of Israel. After this, there was another battle with the Philistines at at Gob, or Gob. At that time, Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giant. Once again, there was a battle with the Philistines at Gob, and Elahan, son of Jerorgim, the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite, um, killed Goliath of Gath. This is a different Goliath. The shaft of his spear was killed, was like a weaver's beam. At Gath, there was still another battle. A huge man was there with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He too was a descendant from the giant. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of David's brother, Shimeel, Shimei, he killed him. These four were descendant of the giant in Gath and were killed by David and his soldiers. In case you're wondering in now why these stories are given to us here, especially if they're not in chronological order, and near the end of the book, well, let me make a couple of observations and then draw out some applications. First, our text reminds me of the words of our Lord recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. And there Jesus said, you have heard it said, you've heard, you've heard that it, it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown in prison truly i tell you you will never get out of there until you've paid every last penny now if you're wondering what the correlation is consider the relationship the lord makes between the offended brother and our worship. Our Lord teaches us to first reconcile our wrong relationship, then commence our worship. Our text in 2 Samuel here is teaching us something very similar. Until the wrong that Saul and his house had done to the Gibeonites had been made right, God would not pour out his blessings on the land. When this wrong was rectified, God's blessing resumed. And God again heard the prayers of his people to remove the famine. Second, you must remember that the author of the book is 
highly skilled. He's an expert about, he's an expert in what he has been set out to do. If you don't understand it, if you're puzzled, if it doesn't make sense uh, about what you're reading, it's not the author's failure, but because it's because you haven't yet grasped what he's set out to do and has done. The author hasn't followed a chronic chronological timeline here, but is carefully, but has carefully developed a theme. And it's your task. It's your job to study this chapter, to see what it is, to learn what it is, so that you can be like, I get it. I understand it. Now third, I see some emphasis here on the next generation. Saul has by now passed, died off as his, and also his sons have as well. These are the sons who could have challenged David's son Solomon for the throne, but God providentially removed them. David here retires from his military career, and it won't be long until he steps down as Israel's king, giving way to his son, to his son Solomon. Ritzbah shows special concern for the bodies of her sons, protecting them from the birds and the beasts. If you think about it, it appears as if we're moving from one generation to the next. And fourth, there, seem, there is a very clear sense of closure in this chapter. If you think about it, this chapter describes the end of David's military career. It's not yet the end of his reign as king of Israel, but the end of his military career. David would no longer go out to fight with his men. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, David's military career began with a contest against Goliath and a victory over the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The beginning of David's career was the defeat of Goliath and the army of the Philistines. Now, the ending of David's military career was, is the final battle with one of Goliath's offspring and the defeat of the Philistines. Let me ask you, have you ever watched how most professional athletes retire? The one thing they never want to do is retire after a bad year or retire with a loss. They want to quit with that win. They want to quit while they're ahead. I can understand that. Maybe you can too. That it's better to go out with a shout of triumph than with a whimper of defeat. I think you and I can agree that David went out about as well as anybody could. Granted, David needed some help to finish a Shibanob, Shibanob, but his fellow, but this fellow was killed and the Philistines were defeated. Now the success I'm thinking about is, is to be seen on a grander scale, on a greater scale. See, when the Israelites demanded a king, it was so that they could, uh, they could have a man who would fight their battles for them and lead them in the battle, especially against the Philistines. What would they do now that David was no longer going to be able to lead them in the battle? Well, the answer is beautiful. But let me take you back even further in time. When the first generation of Israelites had an opportunity to possess the land of Canaan, they failed because they were afraid of the giants who were reported to be in the land. And the story is found in Numbers chapter 13. When the Israelites were intimidated by the Philistines, Goliath was their champion who frightened all those Israelite soldiers at that time. But David stepped forward and killed Goliath. 
and the Philistines were defeated. But now David isn't able to handle the Goliaths the Philistines had put up against him. Does this mean that Israel is in trouble? No, not at all. Think about it. Saul's leadership couldn't produce a man who would take on Goliath. Not even Saul himself could do it. But David's leadership produced many mighty men of war. And when David was no longer able to fight, they stepped up <clears throat> to take on all the Goliaths the Philistines could put up against them. And these offspring of Goliath were killed and the Philistines defeated. What a way to end David's military career. The people no longer needed a king to do the fighting for them. They were willing to fight for themselves, even against the giants, those giants, those offspring of Goliath. Now this is what I call, what I call a great way to retire. There was also a sense of closure in the things that in, in that things left undone, things not dealt with under Saul's administration were now made right by David. The sin of Saul and his bloody house against the Gibeonites has been atoned for, and the land can once again enjoy God's blessings. Not only are the seven sons of Saul given a proper burial, but so are Saul and his sons. So, but so are Saul and his, son, uh, his sons who, were, who had been killed, who had basically only been given a, a quick burial there at, at Jabesh Gilead. And the army of Israel has reached the point where David need no longer fight their battles for them or even with them. There are many mighty, as I mentioned, there are many mighty men who are able to carry on where David left off. This here is an important lesson in leadership. Often people want leaders who will do the job for them. The greatness and the contribution of a leader isn't judged by how big a hole is left when he steps aside. In biblical terms, this should be an insult to godly leaders the task of leaders is not to do everything, but, but to facilitate ministry, to train, to equip, and to encourage others who will take our place and even do a better job than us. A better job than we have. If this is what Christian leadership is to be, then David was a great leader. Under Saul, not one man was willing to stand up to Goliath. In David's ministry, there were many willing and able to do so. David is now free to step aside as the commander of the military and later as king because he has done his job well. He has helped to create a lower level of leadership that is ready to take his place. Most dictators, despots, dread the fact that there are others like this. And they, once they find out that another leader is rising up and lurking in their shadows, they will do everything to eliminate them. But this is not so with David. And it shouldn't be so with us either. My hope is that as this church continues to grow and more younger leaders rise up, that one day, whenever the Lord is ready and I have to step aside, that these leaders, these young leaders, will be able to come up and make Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel a better church than when I and the other leaders had left it. Again, it's not my church. It's the Lord's church. I'm just 
following or answering a call that he gave me. But I know that even at that time, even if, you know, even if it's 20, 30, 40 years from now, um, or whether it's next week, I trust and believe that he's going to have the right person to come and to take my place and he will be an even better pastor, leader, friend than I have been. And I hope so. That's what I want. That's what I would want. But again, that should be your heart too. If you want to serve here in the church, serve with all your heart, all your mind, with all your strength. But when it's time to pass it on to someone younger, to someone maybe who has uh, more, um, more ideas, that I can just do more. It's all right. You know, especially the Lord's calling you to do that. And he, he will call that person, but he will also let you know. You know he will also confirm it to you in, in, in one way or another. But, again, we shouldn't be acting like dictators and despots and try to kick anybody out that we would consider to be a, a threat. So let's uh, close this morning's service with, uh, with prayer.